It's my great pleasure now to be at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Developmental Biopsychiatry Research Program at McLean Hospital. He received a PhD in Experimental Psychology from the Johns Hopkins University and an MD from Yale Medical School, followed by residency training in psychiatry at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Taisha is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of, Psy of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, BMC Medicine and Adversity and Resilience Science. He is a member of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Juvenile Bipolar Research Foundation, a member of the Board of Children, Youth and Families at the, Acad at the National Academics of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, the Board of Directors of the Trauma Research Foundation, and he has been part of Harvard University's Brain Development Working Group. Dr. Taisha has received over 30 years of continuous NIH funding, served on or chaired numerous review committees for the National Institutes of Health articles, been awarded 19 US <laughs> patents and has received numerous honours. And I can't believe that you are, have made some time for us today, Dr. Taisha. Thank you very much. Take it away. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk. I just wish I was, um, just wish I was there in person. Um, so do we. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I hope the internet connection is good. I'm actually on vacation in um, on an island off the coast of South Carolina, and just hope that the uh, internet works. Um, so, um, and everybody see the slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the effects of childhood maltreatment on the brain, and what we are learning in the terms of that research, in terms of sensitive periods, uh, different effects of different types of maltreatment um, and what's going on in the brain of individuals who appear to be resilient or recovered. Um, this will be more basic, um, not anywhere near as, as practical and as formative as, um, as Seaburns was, but I hope that it gives you an understanding of what's going on in the brain and gives you new insights as to what you might be doing or endeavoring to do when you're um, treating individuals who've had childhood trauma or childhood maltreatment. Um, so just to begin, let me just give you a definition of childhood maltreatment. I like the World Health Organization definition, all forms of physical and or emotional ill treatment, sexual abuse, neglect, or negligent treatment or commercial or other exploitation resulting in actual or potential harm to the child's health, survival, development, or dignity in the context of a relationship of responsibility, trust, or power. And you can see from the last part how much you know, betrayal is a um, core feature of maltreatment. Um, from psychiatric perspective, we tend to think about three types of maltreatment, sexual abuse and physical abuse and witnessing interparental violence as quote of the terrible three, because these are the types of maltreatment that the DSM would recognize as traumatic. Uh, from a medical legal perspective, one tends to think about physical abuse, physical neglect, and sexual abuse, uh, because for young children, uh, physical abuse and physical neglect can be potentially lethal, and sexual abuse is a major felony. And these are the kind of things that mandated reporters tend to report, and um, also uh, major reasons for terminating parental rights. Uh, what's too often overlooked uh, is emotional abuse, which can come in the form of parental verbal abuse or emotional manipulation and emotional neglect. And as we'll see, these are also very important and really can't be overlooked. Um, maltreatment's highly prevalent. If you look at adults without any psychiatric history, about 15% will report retrospectively moderate to severe maltreatment. Um, somewhat more than half of adults with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression will report moderate to severe maltreatment. And if you look at adults with persistent um, depressive disorders, about three quarters of those will report moderate to severe maltreatment. So it's, it's popular, it's, it's, it's common in general, but really very, very prevalent in individuals who have 
uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, and maltreatment, of course, is a risk factor uh, for psychiatric disorders. Uh, we know a lot about this from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study uh, by uh, Vince Felitti and Robert Anda. And they looked at 10 types of maltreatment or household dysfunction. And they um, retrospectively assessed how many of these uh, individuals reported. And what they did is they found a dose response relationship between number of types of adversity reported and risk for various psychiatric disorders and medical disorders. And what they do is they calculated a parameter known as the population attributable risk fraction, um, which basically means that if you could magically make childhood um, adversity you know, go away, how many fewer cases um, would you have? And you would reduce anxiety disorders by about 30%. You would reduce childhood onset psychiatric disorders by about 45%. Uh, current episodes of depression by about half. Uh, suicide attempts by about two thirds. You would also diminish uh, drug abuse by about half, alcoholism and IV drug use by about two thirds. So just think about that for a minute. Think about the millions and millions of people who directly suffer uh, from these problems. Think about the millions of people whose lives um, they touch and all of the lost productivity and all the expenses and all of the just incredible suffering that goes on and realize how much the root cause of this appears to be childhood adversity. Um, it also, um, they found that it prospectively predicts your risk of being prescribed certain medications. Having five or more of these adverse experiences will double your risk over time of being prescribed an anti-anxiety medication, will increase by about threefold your risk of getting an antidepressant, about tenfold your risk for getting an antipsychotic, and about 17-fold your risk for getting a mood stabilizer. And you can also see from this that maltreatment is a major risk factor also for psychotic disorders, including schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder. Um, what's also really problematic is that individuals who've had very, very high levels, uh, six or more of these ACEs, have a nearly 20 year reduction in lifespan. And this is not simply because they've been abusing drugs and alcohol, um, it seems like their body. Uh, is um, showing accelerated maturation. Their telomeres are shrinking at a more rapid rate, producing you know, sort of biological aging in their cells. And they will have uh, disorders like cancer appear you know, 16, 17 years earlier than in individuals who haven't had this high level of adversity. Um, so it's, it's just devastating um, to be exposed to this level of childhood maltreatment. Um, so the big question that I've been pursuing in the lab is what does maltreatment do to the brain? And when I started doing this research, you know, our basic thinking was that stress was bad for the brain and stress was particularly bad for the developing brain. Um, but after pursuing this research for a while, it sort of dawned on me, does it really make sense that through all of the eons of evolution that brains haven't been selected to be you know, pretty resistant to the effects of early adversity because early adversity has been very much part of mammalian development and part of our evolutionary ancestry. And we figured, you know, to be, if the brain is being, you know, damaged by maltreatment, you know, there should be a selection factor uh, for brains that aren't damaged. And this led me to believe that the but that is actually not what's happening. The logical terms of exposure to early stress generates molecular and neurobiological effects that alter neural development, but it does so in a potentially adaptive way that prepares the brain to survive childhood and reproduce in a potentially malevolent world. So what's going on is not nonspecific damage. It's just not, you know, cortisol is just not just wiping out neurons. Um, it's being modified in very selective ways. And these very selective ways um, through the uh, oral evolutionary ancestry is designed to try to help us survive and reproduce. Um, and they may help us get through childhood, they may help us reproduce, uh, but they may be highly maladaptive in other contexts and throughout the rest of your life. And so you will see this um, as, um, you know, psychopathology, you see this as you know, medical illness, um, um, 
but these uh, alterations can be understood best as a form of phenotypic adaptation. Um, you can see this also in animal models, um, really brilliant experiment from um, one of Michael Meany's um, protégés. And um, you can uh, look at rats and rat mothers um, have a bell-shaped curve in terms of how much licking and grooming they uh, provide their uh, pups. And if you look at rats that mothers that provide low levels of licking and grooming to their pups, that affects their pups hippocampus. And their hippocampus has um, shorter dendritic branch length in the pyramidal cells, lower spine density, uh, impaired long-term potentiation. Uh, when you study them under basal conditions, the animals don't perform well as well uh, in memory tasks. Um, however, if you uh, produce the uh, rat version of cortisol, corticosterone, uh, into the electrophysiological bath, you will now have greater long-term potentiation in their hippocampus than you will in, um, in rat pups that were um, raised by um, much more attentive mothers. And these um, rat pups, or you know, growing rats now, who had this uh, early maternal neglect, um, they will perform better in, in certain tasks uh, under highly stressful conditions. So you have a shrunken hippocampus that doesn't perform as well at baseline, but does perform better under stressful circumstances. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the phenotypic adaptation. Um, so uh, basically this first principle is that, that um, maltreatment does not in general result in nonspecific brain damage. It's producing specific phenotypic modifications that may foster survival and reproductive success, but may also be particularly at later ages and other settings, highly maladaptive. So what might be a beneficial phenotypic adaptation? And I'm gonna focus on, on this one because I think it's most relevant to um, the work that you're likely doing. And that is an enhanced ability to detect and respond to threats. And here's a, a circuit diagram of what's going on in terms of threat um, detection and response. I'm sure you've all seen uh, versions of this diagram. I think this one's trying to be fairly complete. Um, and this is how you're responding to visual threat. And information comes in to the thalamus. Um, in the visual system, and there's a low road. There's a direct pathway uh, from the thalamus to the amygdala. And once it's activating the amygdala, it can uh, activate the insula, and that can produce you know, interoceptive um, sensations and feelings. Uh, it also connects to the hypothalamus, and you get your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal response um, to the stress. Uh, it predicts the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and to the periaqueductal gray in the midbrain. And you get, sorry, your defensive reactions and it can project to the nucleus accumbens and you get defensive actions. And this is all part of the low road and the amygdala response. And this can happen very rapidly and can happen below the level of conscious awareness. Um, it also has a high road where it's projecting to the occipital cortex and it's projecting to primary and secondary visual cortex uh, from there, it's going to uh, secondary association cortex, like the inferior occipital gyrus and the lingula gyrus and the fusiform gyrus, which are going to be involved in uh, certain types of recognition, like facial recognition. And then um, there's a projection to the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, and there's an information loop where it's really trying to figure out whether we have enough information to decide if there's a threat or not. And if there is sufficient information, that's then passed on to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, this is a region that's become very, very much of interest to me. Um, the inferior frontal gyrus, uh, there's the pars triangularis, the pars orbitalis. Um, it's, it's part of Broca's area. And this is on the left side, it's part of the you know, language network. And I think that's uh, according to Ledoux, and I believe he's right, it's important that this information gets into the, into the language pathways and um, uh, higher cortical regions for us to actually really experience these emotions. So just activating the amygdala doesn't produce fear. It doesn't produce anxiety. It actually has to get into higher centers. And it gets in, you know, in many ways, 
through the inferior phalangitis, also through the insula. Um, and interesting in terms of what um, um, Seabrim was talking about, um, with a large input from the visual system. Uh, that's on the left side, brings you to your language pathways. Your right side uh, is involved in motor inhibition. And so it, when you uh, think there might be a threat and you stop to listen closely, um, this is will inhibit your motor behavior. And then it passes on to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which plays a major role in inhibiting the amygdala. Uh, the dorsal anterior cingulate, in contrast, can activate uh, the amygdala. And so you have this whole um, system and information also goes to the hippocampus, which can bring in uh, contextual um, memories. So you have this, this complicated system. Um, and I want to focus on um, some of the key components of the system. Let me start with the amygdala. Um, so here's the amygdala. It's an almond-shaped nucleus. And it's a key limbic structure. It's critically involved in implicit emotional memories and detecting and responding to salient stimuli, such as facial expressions and potential threats. And the structural functional abnormalities in the amygdala have been observed in most psychiatric disorders that you can think of, PTSD, social phobia, specific phobias, unipolar and bipolar depression, addiction, autism, borderline personality, and schizophrenia. Um, we have a good understanding of what stress does to the amygdala in animal models. It leads to persistent neuronal hypertrophy of the pyramidal cells. Um, these are very enduring change. They don't simply reverse with time. If they happen during development, they don't simply reverse. When we get enhanced prefrontal connectivity with the amygdala, um, they're there. And um, it takes effort to um, undo these consequences. Um, if you um, put somebody in the scanner and expose them to threat, um, like a frightening face, you will tend to see amygdala activation, and you'll particularly see amygdala activation on the right side, and that the degree of amygdala activation will correlate with your degree of exposure to childhood maltreatment. So these are your childhood trauma questionnaire scores, and the higher your scores, the greater your amygdala response is on average um, to threat. So a big question that we've been pursuing, are there sensitive periods? Um, you know, if stress is affecting the brain, is it going to have different effects depending on how developed the brain is? You know, so depending on the stage of exposure. And we've done um, a lot of this research with uh, Carlin Lyons Ruth, who's an attachment researcher at Harvard. And um, she had a cohort of individuals that she carefully studied attachment in when they were infants and has continued to follow these individuals for about 30 years. Um, and um, we got some money funding from the Harvard Catalyst to bring in a subset of these individuals um, with varying degrees of attachment disruption, compared them to some very healthy controls that we had. And we looked at the um, amygdala volume. We found that amygdala volume was enlarged to some significant degree, not much, but significantly on the left and the right side. Uh, on the left side, it correlated with their degree of childhood maltreatment. Uh, on the right side, uh, sorry, on the right side, it correlated with the degree of exposure to childhood maltreatment. On the left side, it did not. And on the right side, we found that it was particularly sensitive to maltreatment at 10 or 11 years of age. We didn't see any direct association on the left side. But when Carlin looked at her attachment data, she found a significant correlation between left amygdala volume and degree of attachment disruption um, at 18 months of age when these, um, when these infants were assessed. Um, so interesting, we're feeling maltreatment affecting the right and uh, attachment disruption affecting the left. And so this, if you think about it, there are two critical developmental threats. Um, one developmental threat that an infant faces is rejection or um, neglect or abandonment. And another developmental threat that they would face um, would be various forms of abuse and maltreatment. Um, and what this data leads us to hypothesize is that perhaps the left amygdala uh, is specialized for detecting attachment threat, whereas the right amygdala is specialized for detecting other kinds of threat. And this makes sense from a, um, a brain perspective. The um, left frontal regions are specialized to a significant degree uh, for approach behaviors and right frontal regions are specialized for withdrawal behaviors. And so if you're detecting a um, attachment threat, uh, it would make sense to have an approach response. If you're detecting other forms of abuse, um, 
a withdrawal response may be, uh, may be much better. Um, so I think it's interesting to be able to think about left and right amygdala in that perspective. And it may vary from person to person. This is a statistical average in terms of left or right. Now that's um, looking at the amygdala at a structural level. We can also look at the amygdala at a functional level. And as I showed in the slide previously, uh, maltreatment is associated with an increased amygdala response to threat. Uh, often people call about a hyperactive response um, to threat. Um, but there are also psychiatric disorders in which the amygdala has a blunted or hypoactive response to threat. The hyperactive responses have been associated with anxiety and inhibition, whereas the blunted responses have been associated with, with risk-taking and inappropriate social behavior. And maltreatments are a risk factor for both types of disorders, both internalizing and externalizing disorders. So we were wondering if there are types of experience that may lead to a hyperactive amygdala response and types of experience that may lead to a blunted amygdala response. And we looked at this in the 202 participants between, um, I think, 20 and 25 years of age. And um, as part of this research, we developed a tool um, that I'll talk about for a second, the Maltreatment and Abuse Chronology of Exposure Scale. And Angelica Paraga came over from Germany and helped uh, with the development of this. And this um, scale, which we call the MACE, um, looks at exposure to 10 types of maltreatment. It's similar to the ACE, but I eliminated certain types of maltreatment, certain of adversity on the ACE that seem to confound uh, exposure with genetic factors. Um, and so this um, and eliminated um, separation or divorce because it doesn't actually tell you what the child experienced. It can vary enormously between individuals. Um, in this case, we have uh, factors such as sexual abuse, parental physical abuse, parental emotional abuse, uh, parental nonverbal emotional abuse, um, uh, witnessing into parental violence, witnessing violence to siblings, pure emotional abuse, pure physical abuse. But these are also very, very important forms of maltreatment. And then emotional neglect and physical neglect. And the scale collects information on exposure to the items that make up these, these categories. Um, and they indicate which ages they've experienced these things. So we get readings of severity to these 10 types of maltreatment across each year of childhood. And we can get graphs like this that show how these types of adversity um, vary uh, over the course of development. You can see things like emotional neglect and physical neglect are fairly flat. They don't change all that much over the course of development. Um, things like parental physical maltreatment peak early in childhood and as the kids get bigger, uh, this goes down. Um, parental verbal abuse and nonverbal emotional abuse is a form of emotional manipulation. They tend to peak in teenage years. Um, witnessing into parental violence, witnessing violence to siblings more in middle childhood. Uh, you can see that uh, exposure to sexual abuse, that there's a big gender difference um, with this becoming more prevalent in females, particularly after the age of around seven or eight. Uh, and you can see in contrast that that peer physical bullying is uh, more problematic in, in males. And um, Leptic and Khan has been doing research in the lab looking at this as a risk factor for psychopathology. And uh, Jin Jun Zhu came over and did his PhD thesis in the lab from uh, China South University um, and um, looked at this in terms of sensitive periods in um, amygdala and other brain regions. And what we did was he had individuals in the scanner looking at um, fearful versus uh, angry faces or um, neutral faces or geometric shapes. And um, and we get information like this. This is uh, a graph that shows the 10 types of childhood maltreatment across each uh, age that we have data on. And um, this we're using um, artificial intelligence uh, to indicate which of these variables are the most important predictor variables. And we can see that nonverbal emotional abuse at around age nine is a very powerful predictor of amygdala response. You can see pure physical abuse at around age six and pure physical abuse at around age 11 uh, are important predictors. You can pure, pure emotional abuse, like maybe age 17 as an important predictor. So we can identify important predictors. And if we look at these, we can see that um, here are important predictors 
And these predictors were associated with a blunted amygdala response. And these are like pure physical at six, witnessing into parental violence at seven and nine, physical neglect at nine, nonverbal emotional at age nine, and pure physical at 11. On the other hand, these experiences, emotional neglect at 14, parental verbal at 17, pure emotional at 17, and parental verbal at age 18, were predictors of an enhanced amygdala response. Uh, if we look at how the amygdala responds to negative versus neutral faces, if you look in the group that had this later exposure, you can see that it has a very powerful response to the negative face and a very low response to the neutral face. Um, similar in the group that had no exposure, but not as robust. This is, you can see, this is the hyperactive amygdala response here. This is the normal amygdala differential. And in the group that had just this early exposure, it's reversed, that they're actually responding more to the neutral face than they are responding to the negative face. Um, so it's, um, we have two sensitive periods, one basically between age six and 11, another here between age 14 and 18. And, um, and in this exposure during this period blunts the amygdala response in early adulthood. And this exposure leads to a hyperreactive response uh, in early adulthood. Um, so that may help us understand why um, maltreatment can produce a whole variety of different um, psychiatric problems. Um, interesting, if we look at um, the types of diagnoses that these individuals had, um, you can see that there were 57 individuals who had no exposure, 68 who had late exposure. We only had 17 with the early exposure only. Um, so um, these are more trends than, than rigorous findings. Um, but about 14% of the individuals with no exposure had a lifetime history of major depression. It was 31% in the late exposure group and only about 6% in the early exposure group. Um, 8.6% had generalized anxiety in the no exposure group, 14.7% had it in the late exposure group, 0% had it in the only early exposure, same with specific phobias. On the other hand, obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms was, was highly, was prevalent in this group, but, um, but less so in here. And, um, and you can see that there is um, relatively low levels of personality disorder, but, um, but more so in the individuals with early and the late exposure. So um, it may be that early exposure versus late exposure sets you up to have a different array of uh, psychiatric problems. So let me move on to the hippocampus. Um, so hippocampus, um, key limbic structure critically involved in the formation and retrieval of explicit memories, including autobiographical memories. Hippocampal abnormality has been reported in several different psychiatric disorders, pretty much the same array as with the amygdala, PTSD, major depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, drug addiction, borderline personality disorder. Um, interestingly, stress has the opposite effect on the hippocampus as it does on the amygdala in, um, in animal studies. Um, it causes dendritic shrinking, the remodeling of the dendrites in the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus. Um, it also suppresses neurogenesis into the dentate gyrus. And these effects are more reversible than the effects on the amygdala. Uh, and research on this was being done by Carl Anderson in the lab and by Kyoko Ohashi. And um, what we found is that there's very important gender differences in um, effects of maltreatment on hippocampal structure. Um, that males were particularly uh, susceptible, well, the Campbell volume of males, was particularly susceptible to abuse during the first seven years. Um, sorry, neglect during the first seven years uh, and not affected by abuse. In females, neglect did not have any impact, um, but abuse did, particularly at ages 10, 11, and 15 or 16. Um, functionally, in the hippocampus, we also find that there are types of experiences, witnessing into parental violence at nine, pure emotional abuse at nine, pure physical abuse at 10, that are associated with a blunted response in the hippocampus, and emotional neglect, parental verbal abuse, pure emotional abuse, and parental verbal abuse between 14 and 17 are associated with an enhanced hippocampal response. You can see the enhanced hippocampal response to negative faces. Um, you can see how it's um, 
somewhat greater response to the neutral face, at least in the beginning. And um, that's the hippocampus. Um, also looking at sensory cortex. Uh, and we asked the question, does the nature of the maltreatment matter? And uh, this work was done by Ji Wook Choi and Akimi Tamada. They were visiting scientists from South Korea and Japan, respectively. And what we did was we looked at fiber tracks using diffusion tensor imaging and track-based spatial statistics. And we looked at gray matter volume using voxel-based morphometry. I mentioned these techniques because these are unbiased whole brain analytical techniques. So basically we fed all of the data into the computer and had the computer indicate what brain regions differed, you know, um, as a correlate of, of the exposure or that differed between groups with high level or low level of exposure. And what we found was, was really pretty fascinating. Um, when we looked at individuals who had high level of exposure to parental verbal abuse and compared into individuals with low levels of exposure to parental verbal abuse, that it specifically affected gray matter volume in the uh, superior temporal gyrus, which is right here, primary auditory cortex. And it affected the integrity of three fiber pathways, but the fiber pathway it affected the most was the arcuate fasciculus. And the arcuate fasciculus interconnects Broca and Wernicke's area and is an important language pathway. So verbal abuse is affecting auditory cortex and a language pathway. Witnessing domestic violence, witnessing visually witnessing multiple episodes of domestic violence affected gray matter volume in primary visual cortex. Uh, and it reduced uh, gray matter volume by about 18% in primary visual cortex. Um, it also affected one fiber pathway, which is the uh, inferior longitudinal fasciculus. And the inferior longitudinal fasciculus um, interconnects the visual system to the limbic system and um, is responsible for your emotional and memory response of things that you see. Uh, sexual abuse also affects the visual system, uh, more the secondary visual system, uh, particularly areas involved in facial recognition. Uh, and uh, these are studies in our lab. Christine Heim, in a similar study, looked at women who had multiple episodes of um, penetrative sexual abuse, and she found specific thinning uh, in the somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for touch and feeling sensation from the clitoris and surrounding general area. Um, so you can see that maltreatment has sensory modality specific effects on the brain. And that these, I guess, are also part of the phenotypic adaptations where the brain is being modified to alter the sensory system that's conveying the adversity, um, perhaps in a way uh, to help one um, you know, tolerate uh, what's happening. Uh, but then there are secondary consequences. You know, the secondary consequence um, in particular um, may lead to problems with, um, with sexual experience. Um, you know, later in life and, um, and the large percentage of individuals, females who've had penetrative sexual abuse uh, do report problems with, uh, um, with sexual experience. Um, these effects on the gray matter volume here may also have effects on, on letter word recognition. Uh, so there may be unintended consequences of these uh, adaptive changes. Um, looking at the prefrontal cortex, um, we're really interested in the various portions of the anterior cingulate, the, uh, the orbital and the ventral medial, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, there's very good data showing that these regions are affected structurally. And we're finding same kind of things that early exposure um, versus more teenage exposure. Well, these will lead to blunted response. These will lead to enhanced response. You can see that in terms of the dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, you can see that in terms of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, how dramatically this enhances the response. And you can see that in terms of this uh, frontal fronted gyrus pars triangularis with really very opposite responses in these regions. Um, now, what are the clinical consequences? Uh, McCrory and colleagues in an article in 2017 uh, proposed that functional abnormalities in threat processing would act as a latent vulnerability, increasing risk for developing anxiety disorders rather than directly producing symptoms. And we use logistic regression modeling to assess whether differences in regional bold response 
um, was associated with a lifetime history of anxiety disorders. And we found in particular that um, this was predicted by bold response in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and by the inferior frontal gyrus pars triangularis. Um, a one SD increase in negative versus neutral bold response in the ventral medial markedly reduced the risk of having an anxiety disorder. It reduced by about sixfold your risk of having an anxiety disorder. Whereas a one SD increase in the bold response in the pars triangularis increased your risk of having an anxiety disorder by about five and a half fold. Um, so one is uh, going to suppress amygdala response. The other one is going to convey this information, this fear, this anxiety uh, into your conscious awareness. Um, so maltreatment exerts prominent effects on key components of the threat detection and response circuit, which with early exposure can lead to a blunted response and with later childhood exposure can lead to an enhanced response. Um, point is, time is running short, so I'm gonna skip uh, a few things. Um, it also affects the reward system. It also affects the corpus callosum, which interconnects the hemispheres. And um, in females, interestingly, it affects the myelination of these fiber pathways. In males, it affects the integrity of the axon. And it leads to, uh, to a significant degree with less communication between the left and right hemisphere. And we think that's another uh, factor that's leading to affective instability in these individuals, that their, their hemispheres are not uh, as well integrated. Um, so a lot of what we've done focused on, um, you know, specific brain regions, but these regions um, are all part of networks. And so we look at this from a network structure standpoint, and particularly asking the question, um, what's going on in individuals who are resilient? You know, for every individual that we see, you know, who has lots of psychiatric problems and, you um, you know, and significant exposure to maltreatment, we can find another individual who's had pretty similar exposure to maltreatment who doesn't seem to have any psychiatric disorders whatsoever and seems to be doing you know, well in every way that we can assess. Um, so you can always see these individuals who appear to be highly resilient. And the question is, what's going on with their brain? You know, is their brain spared? Does their brain look you know, much more similar to individuals who had no exposure to maltreatment? And, um, oops, and um, what we found is that's absolutely, totally not the case. Here is a listing of all of the changes in the brains that we and others have observed in individuals with childhood adversity who have no psychiatric symptomatology. And so you're getting your prefrontal regions, um, you're getting your insula, you're getting your fiber pathways, you're affecting your amygdala response to threat, you're affecting reward system response, you're affecting how well your default mode network deactivates when you're involved in a task, um, you're affecting sensory association cortex, you're affecting your cerebellum, um, you having pretty much everything that you see in maltreated individuals with psychopathology, you see in maltreated individuals without psychopathology, which then leads to the um, question of what's going on. So these findings suggest that these psychiatric resilient individuals are not neurobiologically unaffected, but that they're effectively compensating through other mechanisms. And the critical question is how do they manage neurobiologically to maintain mental health despite a host of abnormalities in stress susceptible structures? Um, so we, did, we took a sample, we had 342 individuals that we had MACE data on that we neuroimaged, um, and we broke them into three groups. Um, two of the groups were matched um, that had high levels of exposure to maltreatment, and these groups did not differ significantly in their exposure to any of the 10 types of maltreatment. And then we had our controls who had much lower exposure to maltreatment. And then one of the groups was asymptomatic. So this group did not differ from the controls in their level of symptomatology and in their substance use or their drinking, whereas this group um, was um, quite symptomatic. And so we have a control group, a maltreated asymptomatic group, and a maltreated symptomatic group. These are matched for maltreatment. These are matched for symptoms. And we looked at their brain network architecture and don't have time to go into this in detail. Um, basically, 
uh, the brain, like many other um, networks, has a small world property. And this consists of communities that are uh, interconnected. The connections within a community are much denser and uh, richer than connections between the communities. And there's a balance in the network between um, the integration within a community and the segregation uh, between communities. And this is a ideal structure for organizing uh, a network. You can convey information uh, across the network pretty quickly, um, but it's less metabolically costly than having everything connect to everything else, um, which um, because all of these connections um, are uh, costly in terms of the brain. And um, what we found is these are some properties of the, of the network, uh, global efficiency, its small worldedness, and its vulnerability to disruption. And we looked at the asymptomatic and the symptomatic maltreated individuals, and they differed significantly from the controls. And there's really no difference between the asymptomatic and symptomatic in terms of how different their networks are. If anything, it's a bit worse in the asymptomatic maltreated individuals. So again, finding the same effects on the brain in the symptomatic and the asymptomatic maltreated individuals. Um, but we figured that resilience may occur if you took a node that's misfiring or working abnormally in the um, maltreated individuals and you reduced its impact on the network. You reduced how much influence it was having on the entire brain network. And that may reduce your symptoms. And, uh, and we looked. Uh, and the idea that if you have a malfunctioning node and it has somewhat fewer connections, it's going to have less consequence. And maybe the network can now compensate in this case where it can't compensate in that case. And so we looked at a parameter called nodal efficiency, which measures uh, the ability of a node to spread information to other nodes in the network. And we looked um, specifically at the right amygdala, which this is the one that's overactive in terms of, you know, usually a hyperactive response to threat. And we found that in the controls and the symptomatic, you had a relatively high level of nodal efficiency. And in the asymptomatic, you had a lower level of nodal efficiency. And then we used machine learning to say, are there other nodes that distinguish um, the symptomatic from the asymptomatic group? And, um, and it could be that they have higher nodal efficiency. It could be that they have lower nodal efficiency. Um, we identified eight other brain regions that differed in nodal efficiency uh, between the symptomatic and the asymptomatic. And in every case, it was the same. It was always the case that the asymptomatic individual had lower uh, nodal efficiency. And um, it may seem confusing that reducing nodal efficiency was associated with resilience as a normal indication would be to believe that resilience should stem from enhanced connectivity. But when it comes to the brain, bigger may not be better and less may be more. Postnatal brain development goes through both an overproduction and a pruning phase with marked increments in efficiency and performance resulting from the strategic pruning of connections. And in network design, it's not beneficial for nodes to have as many connections as possible. They need to have an optimal number and configure of configuration of connections and the sparse network, which in the case of the maltreated individuals with fewer frontal hubs, it may well be optimal for certain nodes to have reduced connectivity or nodal efficiency. And basically understand these as reducing the connectivity of nodes that may be, you know, symptomatic. Um, so um, this is probably what's going on. And the question is how, how good was this uh, in terms of discriminating these groups and basically looking at information about the network architecture and information about nodal efficiency uh, in these handful of parameters enabled us to discriminate the three groups with about 90% uh, accuracy uh, using the existing sample and using uh, cross-validation, we could do it with about 80% accuracy. So this probably is giving us some potentially interesting information about what's going on um, with resilience. Um, here's an example here in terms of this region, this, this pars triangularis that is this pathway um, to consciousness from the threat detection response system. It's also, as I mentioned, part of Broca's area, and it's a region that's part of your inner voice in your head. And individuals who have high nodal efficiency uh, those with high exposure to maltreatment have high levels of depression, have high levels of anxiety. 
Um, those with low exposure to maltreatment have low levels of depression and anxiety, but you can see the more exposure to have maltreatment, the more symptomatic you are. Individuals with low nodal efficiency, they show no effect of maltreatment. So these individuals are highly resilient to the effect of maltreatment. These individuals are highly susceptible in terms of the symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, so well, if we look at the effects of maltreatment, uh, you can think about it in terms of its course. And there are some individuals who experience maltreatment who get slightly symptomatic and then bounce right back to the normal. And this is called a minimal impact resilience pattern. There are individuals who get exposed to maltreatment who wind up highly symptomatic and asymptomatic, and this is a chronic course. And there are other individuals who become symptomatic, they stay symptomatic for a period of time, and then they show recovery. And so we can, so some of our asymptomatic individuals are this minimal impact course, and some of our asymptomatic individuals are the recovery course. So we split these individuals out. And what we found is that in the minimal impact group, basically you have a vast array of alterations in nodal efficiency in eight out of nine of these regions. In the recovered group, you only had a reduction in nodal efficiency in two out of these nine regions. In the right amygdala, sorry, and in the um, right subcolossal gyrus, um, which leads one to suspect that if you can change the nodal efficiency in this brain region, and if you can change the nodal efficiency in that brain region, that that may be sufficient to foster recovery. So what this basically is suggesting um, is that, um, that you're unlikely with treatment um, to reverse the effects of maltreatment. Um, some of these changes are going to be um, really, really hard um, to reverse. Um, you're not going to remyelinate your corpus callosum uh, or enhance your axonal integrity. Um, but what allows people to have a very high level of function are these um, secondary alterations that enable effective compensation and that what you may be able to do is to um, reduce changes that enable uh, highly effective compensation and targeting the right amygdala, targeting the right subcolossal gyrus um, may be um, um, particularly useful strategies uh, for doing so. Um, the, the last part I want to talk about um, is just the idea of ecophenotypes. And I'll just do this very quickly. This is work that we've been doing with Jackie Sampson. And if you look at maltreated individuals, if you look at individuals with various psychiatric disorders, PTSD, substance use disorders, general anxiety, uh, major depression, you'll find that there's a subset with no history of maltreatment and a subset with maltreatment. Um, so in each one of these diagnostic groups, you'll have a maltreated and a non-maltreated subgroup. And that what we're postulating is that maltreated and non-maltreated individuals with the same primary DSM diagnosis are clinically, neurobiologically, and genetically distinct. And the maltreated subtype has an earlier onset, more severe course, more comorbidities, greater symptom severity, and generally have a poor response to treatment. Um, here's one example, um, looking at... Um, response to SSRIs in individuals with um, major depression, um, large sample in uh, those individuals with no history of abuse, about 84% remitted on um, one of three common uh, and, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, in those who had abuse, particularly between the age of four and seven, we only had about a 16% remission rate. Um, the maltreated subtype also has um, autoimmune metabolic cardiovascular inflammatory problems and has a high risk for obesity that you don't see in the non-maltreated subtype. Um, they have hippocampal and amygdala differences that you don't see in the maltreated subtype. Um, I'll skip that part. And that basically what we're uh, concluding is that there's going to be a maltreated and a non-maltreated non subtype with these major different psychiatric disorders. Uh, in the maltreated subtype, you're going to see morphological abnormalities in stress susceptible structures. Uh, in the non maltreated subtype, um, you're probably going to see more in the way of neurochemical or functional abnormalities, which may be why this group tends to do better on medication than this group, which often doesn't have a great response to medication. <laughs>
Um, so maltreatment and non-maltreatment is the same primary DSM disorder appear to be clinically and neurobiologically distinct. And this observation has far-reaching ramifications for diagnosis, treatment, and research. Um, and we're currently looking at this in terms of substance abuse disorders. We're looking at um, discrimination as another um, early childhood maltreatment risk factor. And we've been looking at the effects of, um, of treatment. And one of these days, we would love to add um, neurofeedback to the list of treatments that we're, that we're looking at. So I uh, also want to give a shout out to Cindy McGreenery and Elizabeth Bolger, uh, who have been the clinical research coordinators for these studies. And also uh, a shout out to the various um, sources of funding that we've had for this research over the course of years. And I tried to leave at least a little bit of time for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marty. Um, I've got a million questions, but I'll open it up to the floor and um, let some other people ask. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, um, how would all these theories could be applied to the on a social level? Like, for example, the, um, I think the Russia, for example, is the um, kind of um, many generations of trauma. How the uh, whole country can be recovered when, um, when it's such a deeply dysfunctional? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I, um, what I wrote about in an article in, I think in Scientific American in 2002 um, was, was, you know, part of that from society, that society reaps what it sows in the way that it treats its children. Mm -hmm. And that um, when you have, you know, war and you have genocide and you have these factors, um, you're producing all sorts of problems, you know, in the, um, in the children who survive. And that's going to come back to bite you 20 years later. Um, you know, so it, it's just, um, you know, you, you just you just create, you know, incredible problems because, you know, their, their brains are going to be wired, you know, um, to, um, to see everything is um, as stressful and traumatic and, and be highly injured. And, you know, and then this may wind up, you know, with a repeated cycle of violence. So it's, it's just devastating for the world uh, to have these kind of events occur. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I don't know if you remember um, a neurobiologist, um, James Prescott, who wrote an article in uh, Futurist magazine in 1975 about body pleasure and the origins of violence. And he was looking at um, children who'd had um, a lot of pleasure and nurturing in their childhood uh, and how uh, it affected their brain and, and, and the societies that did that um, uh, were less violent versus um, societies who were very uh, punitive to the children in childhood and in adolescence, uh, sexually repressed societies that uh, punished children for engaging in sex versus pleasure. Those societies uh, across 140 or 50 countries, he looked across the world, that where there was um, this um, repression of pleasure and uh, how it affected the brain structures in those people tended to produce people and societies who are more violent. Um, I, has there been any interest in looking at um, your examination of um, brain structure and the propensity to violence, for example, um, uh, acting out on, on violence, you know? Sure, you know we have information. Like domestic on violence. Yeah, we, we have information on <clears throat> that in terms of like whether they had oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder or conduct disorder symptoms. Um, we have um, certainly we have a lot of information on their levels of anger and irritability, or, or anger and hostility, um, and you know maltreatment is a big risk factor for uh, anger and hostility. Um, 
it would be interesting to go back and look at that and to look at that more uh, in terms of differences in brain structure. Uh, I do remember that work. And, um, and that was, it's, a, it's a great to remind me of that. I mean, we, can, we can certainly look and see if we can, you know, with more modern imaging techniques, find some, you know, associations that might explain that. But it, it certainly makes sense. I mean, you, you'd predict that that would be, you know, the kind of thing, you know, that a lot of the, um, you know, the punitive treatment of that, that, that would come across as, you know, some of that would come across as verbal abuse, some of the cross would come across as nonverbal emotion, you know, emotional abuse, some of that would come across as emotional neglect. And, um, and those would all be things that would set you up to have high levels of anger and hostility. And I think that that goes along with symptoms of limbic irritability or overactive um, kindled limbic system. So that'd be a great thing to look at further. Mm. Great, thanks. I look forward Thank to you. Uh, uh, um, following, your, following your line of research if you get into that. Mm. Oh, absolutely, we'll, we'll have a look. Yeah. Well, Marty, I'm sure you want to get back to your, your vacation. Thank you again so much for um, spending some time with us today. I know that there was it's a big presentation. I've seen the two-day workshop, so I know you had to condense a lot of information for us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure, and I, I hope that it was useful. And It um, was. I hope the rest of your conference is wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Okay. Bye-bye.